Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am honored to be joined by Brandon Green to talk about biomechanical drumming. Brandon, welcome to the podcast. Bart, thank you so much for having me. It's truly an honor, and I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, man. Um, this is a cool one. You yourself uh, are a YouTuber and do podcasting, and if, if people are watching this on YouTube, you have a very legit setup, um, and we both have like you know the radio mics going and stuff, so it's pretty cool. Um, so, Brandon, why don't we just jump in here, and can you explain what being a biomechanically based drummer means, and then we'll go into like you know how people can take that and apply it to their own drumming and all kinds of cool stuff. So, what is that? Yeah, huge can of worms to jump in, and I'm super excited about this. So, biomechanics, essentially, if we think about that, you know, I'm a big nerd. I like call myself a biomechanically based drummer. I mean, it sounds like a superhero, right? It sounds cool. <laughs> no, but um, biomechanics is the study of mechanical laws relating to the human body or biological systems. And we've got these incredible mechanical laws, thanks to Newton and many others. If you go deeper into thermodynamics, it gets crazy. But we have these basic rules of that in Newtonian physics, we have the rule of force, mass times acceleration, the rule of acceleration or inertia. So an object wants to maintain its current state. Uh, so people that things are, that are not moving want to stay still and things that are moving will keep moving unless there's something that slows it down. And then we have reaction forces. Well, we take those three mechanical laws and we apply that to what we understand of being the human body. There is a ton that we can unpack to think about how do we make sure that this thing that we have, this pile of flesh, this combination of crazy electrical, neurological, mechanical, skeletal muscle, sensory somatic systems all work together to help make sure you have the best experience on the drums. Putting aside all that fluff, for me, being a biomechanically based drummer means someone who is efficient. You're doing everything you can to be risk averse and optimizing your setup and your practice and your playing and something we'll talk about today called hormesis to make sure you get the most out of this thing that we love. I mean, like without going too deep, the reason why I even talk about this professionally, I am busy I got a career that helps to pay for my life. I have a fitness job with a gym that I'm the, the owner of called Strat Internal Performance. We got 10 trainers that are all thinking in the same biomechanics way. I help old people with aches, pains, problems, and advanced diseases. I love it. I got another awesome. business called Fitness Pro Mentors where we help business uh, entrepreneurs, especially in the fitness landscape, grow their business. But the truth is, is one of my good mentors, you know, like, okay, pardon me for jumping. Remember you were in high school and there was like that one drummer that was in high school or college or elementary school that you looked up to in town that was like the guy or the girl. Can you think of that person? Yeah. What'd they look like? Who were they? Uh, there was, they, we actually looked kind of similar and we ended up playing in a band percussion and drums later, but it was an older guy. Uh, his name was Andy Ward. I'll give him a shout out. Um, but just, Hello, just Andy. had a very good feel and, uh, you know, had a good flow and was just fun to watch. So there was a guy for me named Matt Dunn, and he actually works at Roland Canada now. He's awesome, dude. I love him. If Matt Dunn, if you check this out, man, holler at you. But uh, I watched him play, man, and he was like, he got me fired up. He had like a very Blink-182 style. And, you know, in high school, he had tattoos, like he was the early tattoo adopter, you know what I mean? <laughs> right? Uh, so I wanted to play, and I copied him, like I was obsessed with him for a long time until I found my own style. Well, like eight years ago, he posted on Facebook this thing that said, F my back. I hurt my back from playing the drums, right? Screw the drums. My back screwed forever. And I was like, well, this is wrong, right? There's no yeah. way that this art vessel that we have, this thing that we create so much music and our own meditative mechanical practice, it doesn't make sense to me that this thing should ruin your life. And that's what he talked no. about. So that's what took me taking all my biomechanical and motor learning knowledge and started applying it to drummers. Because truth is, I just want you and anyone that's listening to this to play drums forever and make art forever. It's interesting too, because they don't teach you. Most teachers don't teach you how to take care of your body correctly while you're playing because maybe they don't know as a teacher, you know? So um, let's just maybe hop in here and give some like, what's like the 101 of how to go at this and, and be better about uh, treating your body correctly while you're drumming? Yeah. You know what, man? I was thinking about this and I've created this idea that I'm going to try to help illustrate that I call the three levels of biomechanics for drumming. And I'm going to try and break it down because I think that there's a foundational rudimentary level, <laughs> rudimentary, <laughs> rudimentary level of mechanics that we all need or we are not going to make it on this thing. And then yeah. it gets a little bit more advanced. I, you know, it doesn't take someone to have a very mechanical eye to look at 
late Neil Peart's drum sets and Phil, Phil Collins' drum sets and see like from a distance, from a performance perspective, by far one of the most incredible drum kits you've ever seen, right? Neil Peart's drum set with those eight inch toms over here and yeah. it sends all the way over to 18s that are like literally behind him outside of view. But if you also think about the body, forgetting about any of this biomechanic stuff, if I hung out and I turned my torso to the left as far as I could with my arms out like this, and I hung out in this yoga-like position for a minute, two or five, no one, most people won't be comfortable being there for a long period of time because there's a ton of torque, a ton of tension. Our body can't go much further and our structures are very close to end ranges. Like our spine is turned. The car door is as open as far as it can go. We're knocking on the edge. And so for a lot of those guys, and I remember the uh, Dave Silva, I think the old drummer for Korn, uh, a mm-hmm. lot of these guys have stopped playing drums or stopped because of back pain, right? Phil Collins, back pain, Neil Pert, back pain, Dave Silva also played a ginormous drum set. And I'm not saying that everyone that plays drums is going to have a bad back, but I would say that when you have a large drum set, that's not set up in a way that's surrounding your body properly. We got a big issue. And that's yeah. why, honestly, you know, shout out to you. I love your podcast. I became obsessed with it. Because the first modern drummer article I wrote, yeah, man, you're sick. You're sick. You got a green wall. <laughs> it's a light. It can be any color I want. <laughs> Love it. Right? There's, there's a, the first modern drummer article I wrote referenced the history of the drum set because it's such a weird instrument that we, we took a drum, marching snare drum. We took a bass drum that we used to smack with mallets. We used to take smashing cymbals and we like kind of put it around us to make it work for us. And it's this weird thing that we put instruments around our body and made our body work for the instruments. Hmm, That's interesting. Right? None of it was really based off convenience. DW made a throne that adjusted a little bit. Well, that was a smart innovation. They didn't even think about that before. Same with a snare stand, same with a pedal. So what we need to be thinking about the level one of biomechanics to be someone that's healthy, drummer, is we need to make sure that we're building the drum set around our body. And if you're not building the thing around your body, you're going to have issues. Well, what's like, I mean, so like just kind of if everyone in their, you know, mind's eye can like paint a picture of sitting down, we've all set up a drum set and, you know, you put down your kick and then you maybe set up your snare and your floor tom, put your toms on, pull things in and then step up. And what, what are some tips maybe on how to do that where you're making the drum set work for you? Do you have any tips and tricks of like keeping your leg at 90, you know, what would you say? We're not doing that. (laughs) Not that. <laughs> and that's exactly what I'm talking about, right? Because that's the thing. And this is the thing that's tough with this. And we'll ju- give you a tip right away. But sound bites like that, that our drum teachers have heard, right? You got to sit with your hip at 90 degrees. We have in, in just normal body nomenclature, so many things that we say like that. You have to sit with your hip at 90 degrees, your knee at 90 degrees, your feet flat, your, right? And that these are just pre-choreographed sound bites that mean something like you say it and someone hears it, it sounds familiar and then we adjust to work around it. But that's not a really great example. So I'll tell you what, the simplest thing is introducing an idea called active range of motion. And I did talk, I've talked about this a few times, but anyone that's listening to this and has never heard me speak, I encourage you to practice this because if you work with this one principle, everything else starts to fall in place. So it makes sense that if we have a joint, oh, perfect. I have some spine right for the camera here. Right? <laughs> if I have a joint system and two different bones that come together, right? we all kind of get the idea that two bones come together. When those bones come together, that creates a joint that's called the synovial joint. And we all get that if I bend my elbow in and go out, there's an amount of motion that I can do. And I get to one end where my arm is bent all the way and I can't move it any further. I go all the straight, I can't go any further. And that's either because my muscles can't lengthen or shorten anymore, or the way I want people thinking about it just to help to make this simple is bone is hitting it, hitting bone sooner. Sure. Right. If I turn this thing, boom, this little vertebrae for the camera, I turn the vertebrae, it bumps into it. Can't go any further. The car yeah. doors open as far as it can go. Yeah. Well, drum throne height and figuring out where you should sit, I think is the most important place to start. You can kind of get around everything else, but if you're sitting in one place for 20 minutes to two hours, that's a big problem. And if we think about the actual anatomy of the hip, which is why I got good old Dr. B here, which on (laughs) camera, I have a gigantic skeleton. uh, So this is fun. But if I actually think about this and I pull the leg up as high as I can, you can see on camera and you could imagine that if I pull my leg up from a seated position, there's going to be a point where the bone, the femur hits another bone and I physically cannot go any further because there is architecture and structure in the way. Yeah. That makes sense, right? Yes, of course. You can't lift your leg higher because you're 
you're hitting your your inner your uh, hip flexor area is is just going too high. You can't go any further. Right. So this is the thing. So if you're in a seated position listening to this, or you're someone who's listening to this, go sit on your drum throne. What I want you to do is sit on your drum throne. And even with the camera, I'm sitting high enough that you can't see this. But what I want you to try and do is from the positions where your pedal is, can you lift your thigh straight up towards the ceiling? And can you lift your other thigh straight towards the ceiling? So all Hmm. I'm doing with the skeleton, if you're watching, is I'm lifting my leg up, not from the side, but from right (laughs) over top of the pedal to see, can I lift my leg off of the ground? If you cannot lift your leg off of the ground, your throne is too low. And truth is, if you pick up, there's a biomechanics book I got behind me here called Kapanji. It's all around lower body biomechanics, and it's all around forces and anatomy and structure. Not everyone can even lift their leg from a 90 degree position. Some people don't even have 90 degrees of hip flexion available. So if I don't have that joint motion available or 20% of people don't have that range, and we're using 90 degrees as our stereotypical soundbite, we're sitting too low. So if we can assess our range of motion to ensure the amount of mobility that our body has is available, we can then work within that range, right? Because if I take my shoulder and I go from my side of my body to lift all the way up to 180 degrees, I know the extreme of zero to 180, the zero and the 180 are as far as the door can go, but everything in the middle is pretty good. Yeah. If I had to do something, I wouldn't want to, I just changed, you know, I'm terrified of heights, Bart, terrified. (laughs) And in the gym, we got 25 foot ceilings. I just changed the fluorescent light. I had my arms over my head. My arms got way more tired and sore than they would if I did something in front of me because I'm at an end range. Hmm. So besides all the talking, you know, lots of explaining, explaining here, you want to check your active range of motion to find out how much active control do you have to move your body in the position that you're going to play the drums. Does that make sense? Or does that sound it makes crazy? No, it makes perfect sense. And I think that back when I worked as a drum teacher, I would find that kids or people or friends or whoever, when you set up a drum set, it's almost like you're, you're kind of like, all right, the throne's at this level. Now I'm just going to set up everything around it. And then you're sort of like, you're compensating the whole time if the throne isn't at the right level. Your your snare is going to be off. It's just it's just getting that base level correct height for comfort. Uh, I think is hugely important. And then also just remembering that maybe get a memory lock or a piece of tape or something and mark it so you remember. You know, oh, measuring tape, man. I mean, I tell you, measuring like when people tape. ask me what is the one thing, like do you have one recommendation for my gig bag? I said put a measuring tape in there. And on the measuring tape, mark it snare height, drum throne yep. height. I don't have mine in front of me, but I remember like my snares, I'm pretty sure it's 20, uh, the, the top edge of my snare is at the, the side toward me is 27 inches and the part that's away from me is 27 and a half. There's a reason we could talk mm. about why, but it's easy because then that way I'm not like just, you know, yanking it and seeing if it feels good. I, just, I know that if I'm playing a five and a half inch or a seven inch deep snare, I have to adjust it to make sure the top where it's going to be near is going to be whatever inch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is cool. Mm. This is kind of cool. It Sneaky. is cool. And I, this is like, it's related, but it might be getting ahead. But I always used to tell people, and I mean, I was guilty of that, of being a teacher at Sam Ash, and I would be telling people like certain things like um, that, that, that I kind of just heard. But one of them, which I think is probably correct, though, is the importance, though, of breathing, obviously, is hugely important, but being open, because I've found over the years, and I get shoulder pain. Obviously, it's probably from the drums. It's also probably just from the, you know, the life of working on a computer or something like that and just kind of sitting at a desk. But the, the, the importance of that, of getting air flowing through your body seems hugely important. And then I, I feel like it, the, the way you sit properly goes hand in hand with that, where you, you're set up, set up better to be breathing better and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. The breathing thing is an interesting one. Um, but I would say, and that's a, a different segue, but for, on the mechanical end, you talked about just like sitting up tall and being open. Sure. For a period of time, I was really obsessed with the symmetry idea that Mike Mangini portrayed with his gigantic symmetrical drum set. And it wasn't just, he was popular because it's a cool, crazy looking drum set. But yeah. to me, the idea, like I practiced open-handed playing for a solid three or four years and I tried to play all left lead. And there's actually some interesting reasons why I don't think that's the best way from a musical perspective to play. But from a body perspective, it made sense to me because turning, having your right hand over top of your left hand, you know, you are in some extremes of shoulder position. 
Yep. And you're also inherently restricted, as many of these open-handed guys have talked about, if you want to actually play other instruments. Hence why open-handed playing makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But coming back to the breathing and the openness, I'll share one kind of like mechanical idea is that using a drumstick as a prop for everyone. So this makes kind of fun. So if you, uh, have you ever exercised and done squats or something like that? Yeah. Yep. Right. If you had to pick a position of the squat, right? The top of the squat being standing and the bottom where your legs are far apart, your knees are head and your butt back, and you had to hold it for five minutes, which would be less work standing straight up or squatting and holding at the bottom. I'd probably say standing straight up. Right. And that's like, well, duh, Brandon, of course, the center of your mass, right? The, the, where you are the heaviest is falling through all of your joints. And that distance that we use to talk about torque, when you talk about torque, there's force, right? Which is mass times acceleration. And then the difference between what makes something have more torque or less torque is something called the moment arm, which is a measurement mm -hmm. tool. It's essentially the distance where there's a 90 degree angle. Way more complicated than that. I will just kind of leave it at that. Sure. But when I squat to the bottom, my knees are in front, my hips are back, and my knees are further in front, and my hips are further back than when they are standing, which means that there's more distance from those joints. There's more torque. When there's more torque, my body has to work harder. Is that kind of idea? Yeah. So Makes then sense. when I'm sitting at the drum set, right? And this is where, you know, Buddy Rich, you know, amazing, but yes. he has some pretty terrible posture. You read my and, mind. We, we had to talk about that today. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know Buddy, and I'm sure he probably would have thrown something at me if I ever commented on it based off of the history I've heard of him. <laughs> but if I'm sitting up tall like this, and I have all my body weight, if I'm sitting up tall on the camera, everybody, I have my body weight going down through all of my joints, through my spine, my neck, my hips. I'm not working that hard. So forgetting about what the right posture is, if everything is stacked on top of one of the piece, like we're standing, there's going to be less mechanical work on my body. Yeah. If I even just do this and push my head forward, now there's all this distance from my spine to where the center of mass of my head is. And we can even measure it pretty much. Like, I don't know it from the camera, but it's like six inches of dis distance compared to when it's right over top of it. So that means that all the muscles on the back of my neck have to work harder. And then I get to Buddy Rich posture where I'm leaning all the way forward. Totally just, hunched over. Yeah, it's kind of like almost a colloquial posture for cool jazz guys. Like they all kind of do it, right? <laughs> and the but truth like, is- pe People yeah. would have the, in the defense of them, they would say, but it's Buddy and it worked and he played great. Now, would the argument be that he would play even better if he had more of a modern throne that he could probably lower or, or I guess raise depending on how he's sitting and, and, and get more position correctly? I mean, you know, the argument of it worked for them. I mean, how many of our favorite drummers who did drugs and were exceptional and passed away real early, right? Does that that's mean true. that we're going to all take cocaine and, you know, so if it worked for them, that's great. And Buddy absolutely expressed himself in an incredible way. The only way we would know if Buddy would be a different drummer to compare is if we could do a twinning study with Buddy's twin and we had one that sat tall and one that sat rounded. And that's obviously impossible. Yeah. But I will say that if we look at the anecdotal evidence we have so far, people who sit forward, rounded, and with really low posture, with low throne heights, typically have more back problems, more hip problems, and more sensations they don't like in their body than the latter of people who are sitting up tall and erect. Art is interesting, right? Because you can be in any position of your body to create art. But the truth yeah. is, do we position our body in a way that we can create that art forever? And that's where, you know, yeah. Buddy's not here, unfortunately, to ask him this, but I'd be interested, you know, if he made it to 90, 100, would he still be playing? Yeah. I mean, and it, it's, it's that longevity thing of, yes, you can, you can do it now and be, you know, great, but you're just slowly causing problems. And I'm guilty of that. And I need to, uh, I'm a big believer in like, um, I forget who I heard say it, but like, if you're like, want to go out and exercise and maybe lose some weight or something, you need to look at it as don't be like, I need to join a gym. I need to buy a bunch of clothes. I need to do all this stuff. Like go walk for five minutes and then tomorrow walk for six minutes. And then the next day, seven minutes like that, that kind of don't overdo it. So for me, I feel like I do hunch over a little bit. I end up editing drum history pretty much every night on my couch, like slumped over with like YouTube videos up what kind of in the background. I mean, I think, is it, is it something you would recommend and even sitting on the kit just to kind of always have in the back of your mind to just kind of like, all right, wait, hold on, straighten up a little bit and just kind of try to better yourself like that. Like, like 
to chip away at it and make yourself better a little bit each day. You know, we all know that if we ate broccoli every day, that it would make us healthier. And, you know, the easy answer is yes, we should all be conscious of our body. But I find that working with people for so long, especially, and I'll say this with drummers, anyone that's listening to this, this is not to be a slight at you, but I know that we're all here thinking about art and music. We're uh-huh. less body conscious unless you've had a problem, right? If someone's had a problem, they're always hyper aware of how their body feels. What I would say is practice setting the drum set up around you as best as you possibly can so you don't have to think about it. Because yep. anything that subtracts your thought and attention, even 1%, 0.5% from the thing that you're trying to do will decrease in the quality of that. If I'm talking to you and my wife sends me a text message and I glance over and come back for a split second, that is just enough attention and subtraction that it takes away from the thing. Better example yep. on the drum set, I've been working on playing faster doubles with my right foot. It's all good until my foot gets tired. And then when it gets tired, I get distracted and I go, oh, now it's tired. And then I start flubbing more. And then I get annoyed that I'm tired and flubbing and it turns into this cascade of effects. So the true, the simple answer is how do we mind, how do we set up the NASA star control system to be as perfectly ergonomic for us as possible? So we don't have to think about it. Yeah. And I think that um, I was watching a video the other night. I think it was Jay Weinberg doing like, it was like a drum cam, you know, slipknot video or something. And uh, there's so many great, uh, heavy metal drummers uh, and death metal, whatever, all these different kinds of metal. It's mind boggling to me as someone who really likes metal, but like I'm not great at like blast beats and all the different kind of, you know, crazy metal stuff you can do to maintain that kind of intensity for five minutes at a time. Well, for two hours, really, you know, if you're doing a concert or something and have it not be just like you're so because when I do it and I've I've played metal with friends where I almost feel like I'm like I don't want to say pretending but I'm just kind of getting my way through a song just yeah. like uh, to be able to there must be a secret and of course I can watch like YouTube videos on it on how to be relaxed with it but I think metal guys are a good case study of you really got to be cognizant of how your body's set up and to be able to do that you know thousand mile an hour blast beats and not just burn your hands out yeah. Well, I mean, it comes down to, and that kind of leads into my second point for the biomechanics thing, but I, it's funny you say that, and I forgot to make a note about this, but this is great. If anyone wants to really work on mastering ergonomics, I would say try to set up the most ginormous version of drum, your drum set you possibly can and make everything feel comfortable. Because if you can set up like your own version of one of those metal guy drum sets, like when you yeah. got like the eight to 14, 16 by 18 and two sides and you got, they, you know, they're setting things up to save energy. So that way they don't have to reach and crash, right? And they don't reach like 16 inches up, right? They just like move their hand over and they get a quick crash to move sure. on to the next section. So that's all efficiency, but that's also mechanics. And that's super cool. If you can actually figure out how to set up your drum set in that way, like Derek Rohde's drum set, I remember he, I was, you know, I was one of those Pearl drum form guys from way back in the day. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Holla PDF, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm st- I still go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but Derek, Derek Rohde was like, you know, a guy at that time, like, and his drum set, I remember always looking at it and it was like, it was like a wave of drums. Like it was like snare to toms and then slightly more angled to the cymbals. And then those chinas way up there were slightly more angled and it was one smooth. So that's a great way to practice, yeah. practice figuring out your ergonomics if you want a practical, because if you can't set up something in a crazy spot, it doesn't feel good. I mean, there's no point in playing it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. Or Terry Bozio, Bozio, Bozio. I mean, the the there's almost the like like over the top where he he does it great and he makes it seem pretty comfortable and uses it, but you're using it as a part of your image of of having this mega drum set where things are above you and all that stuff. Um, but it's still you don't want your thing that's your image to then end up being what what really really hurts you. You know, 100%. do you ever like? Do you ever like for fun, like examine and I'm and, and I'm saying it in the most respectful way possible, but like someone like Phil Collins, who's had such terrible back problems that he's literally like he can't play the drums anymore, really. Do you ever uh, look at footage and examine and think maybe like what could have caused those problems? Yeah, I, I hate saying it more than I more than I like. Um, I remember Neil Pert because I, where I live, Neil Pert before passing, lived within a 45 minute radius of me. He was pretty secretive. Oh, wow. I don't know where he lived. My father was actually my, actually it's my, my stepdad. And it was my stepdad's drum that I got here, but he's basically my dad. Uh, sure. He managed the cemetery and his, the cemetery he managed was where Neil's family was. But I know he's relatively close. 
And I, wow. I did everything I could through a modern drummer to try and figure out how to like, just get him a letter to talk to him about that stuff. Because I've watched when his back started going and I heard he wasn't going to go on tour because of rush. It was probably because of other reasons. I wanted mm-hmm. to share something, you know, you watch, if you watch old, not to pick at him, but old Travis Barker videos, because he plays such a, like he's a long guy and he plays like rel- relatively small, like those old OCD dr- drum sets, like they're relatively yeah, yeah. small. When you watch him and he's keeping time on the left foot, right? His left foot is coming off the pedal and going back down, like huge yeah. motion. Now, anyone who's listening to this, go watch one of his videos and watch his hip and then watch the side of his body where his obliques are and watch how much motion happens there. And now he's doing good far as we know, but if you watch him bouncing his leg and seeing him si- squishing on that one side, that shows a bunch of motion that you don't typically see in other drummers. Now, if you forget about Travis Barker and we just thought about the skeleton and we thought about when he lifts that leg, what it means for this part of the spine to be squishing, you know, probably a thousand times in a three to four minute song, probably less than that, but a lot. Yeah. Um, you can imagine how much extra force and stress there is on the left side of his back. And I bet you we'll never get this, but if we got an x-ray of his lumbar spine, I bet you his spine looks a little different on the left side versus the right. Sure. So I've done it a bunch. To be honest with you, I've thought about going on Instagram, like posting, like examining pro drummers and talking. There was one of Omar Hakim where he was sitting super high and I was going to draw some torque angles and talk about that moment arms and talk about that a bit. But I don't want to start poking at these guys because they're all doing their thing. I mean, but that's an interesting thought of like, um, you're, you're coming at it from an angle of wanting to be productive and helpful, but I see where you'd be hesitant because it's kind of like, you know, well, screw you, dude. You know what I mean? Like, like they're looking at it, like it's very personal and it's like, well, you know, you don't want to attack them. And, um, but I think the way you're talking about it though, is like, we can all learn from this and, and this kind of actually, while we're, before I forget, I want to ask the question, cause talking about like Travis Barker and things like that and very flat drums. I think we all know that he kind of, everything's very flat and reaching forward, which, um, I never really played that. I, my brother played in bands where his drummers would do that and I would sit on it and kind of be like, this is fun for a little bit, but it just didn't feel right to me. What level of angle on the toms do you think is, I don't want to say best, but like ergonomically best for your body? Cause you can go too flat and then you're like bending your wrists. I mean, is there a perfect spot you think? I don't think there's a perfect spot, but I think there's a perfect range that you can set it within. And flat both ways, parallel to the ground and perpendicular to the ground is not the way to do it. Um, it's kind of why I brought a drumstick up is that, so if you're watching, anyone that's watching this, uh, coming back to that idea of moment arm, there's something in mechanics. You know, when you think of the story of David and Goliath, right? He took a little sling and he threw the sling, right? And threw this little rock. Well, when you throw a sling or do something like that, where you take a satchel and you throw a stone, you actually have to have the satchel at a 90 degree angle to the direction you want the rock to go, right? So you need to be right out to the side and the rock's going to go 90 degrees to the last point of application. So with your drums, when you hit something with a drumstick, right? The drumstick is going to get reaction force perpendicular to the tip of the stick. So if I take a drumstick and a camera, I got a drumstick, I'm hitting a practice pad. When I hit this, the tip of the stick is going to try to go back up at a straight angle. So if I hold it like this, it's going to try and go this way. Well, that's good. We'll come back to that. We need to be considering the position of the wrist when we do this. So when we have snare drum in front of us and it's flat, you can keep your wrist in a relatively neutral position. Coming back to the extremes of position we talked about, I'm not too extended hitting the, you know, the car door is not all the way open. The car door is not all the way closed. We're in a neutral spot. So if I'm absorbing force here, my joint, my technique, my hands, and the stick can all absorb some of that physics. That's good here. When I reach further out in front of me, it gets a little bit different because now I actually have to reach a little bit more and I actually end up in a greater position of wrist extension so now my wrist is in a potentially more vulnerable position. It's also gotcha. inefficient from the physics perspective, the mechanics, because if I have that drum way out far and it's trying to travel back up to 90 degrees, that means for me to hit it and get more energy, I actually have to use more of my arm than the wrist. I actually have to lift a little bit of everything to come back down. The drumstick is going to try to travel up rather back towards me. 
So if mm. I have, and this is where you see, I mean, everyone kind of finds, I don't want to say perfect angle, but you see everyone's kind of between like this, you know, I'd say 25 to maybe 55 degree angle. Yeah. That's great. Because if I hit that at this angle where my arm's kind of out in front of me, I'm still in the relatively neutral wrist position. The stick's getting pushed back toward me rather efficiently rather than kind of up and away from me and saves my joints. The old sure. Lars Ulrich flat toms in front of me, that gets risky, right? He was a short guy and those toms were close to him. Well, when he's hitting those toms, you can look at those old videos and his wrist is all the way cocked back and he doesn't have much distance to generate power, let alone absorb force. Hmm. So is there a perfect angle somewhere in between? This episode is brought to you by Ghost Note Percussion. Ghost Note is run by my friend Jared Fallon, who a lot of you guys probably remember from the recent Orange County episodes, uh, and he did a great job on that. Jared has over 15 years experience as a studio and touring drum tech. He specializes in repairs, restorations, and modifications. And he also builds really beautiful custom crafted drums of his own, which I highly recommend you check out. The thing that makes Jared pretty unique, though, is that he is great at doing uh, not only appraisals of unique drums, so he'll give you a price for something that's kind of hard to put a number on, but also he will track down and find unique, rare, odd drums that other people can't seem to find. And lastly, he offers tech and tuning services for studio and live performances. I'll put a link in the description of this episode, but you can find him on Instagram at ghostnote underscore percussion. That's ghostnote underscore percussion. Or email him at jared.fallon, F-A-L-L-O-N, at yahoo.com. It's jared.fallon at yahoo.com. I think, though, like the argument, which is not a good argument, though, is like for Lars, for Travis Barker, it looks kind of cool. That style of pop punk with perfectly flat with your like uh, powder coated blue rims and your, you know, like you, you can see it's really cool looking. And then metal drum sets, huge kind of flat angled, you know, right at you. Very cool. But again, I guess you just got to think more about the long term in a lot of these uh, situations. And I think of, too, of like, you know, it's everything you've practiced your whole life on drumming. You kind of have to like it's like it's not like you're throwing things away that you've always done. You just need to like practice and like work at it for a little bit to get comfortable with your new setup because there has to be a little bit of a, I don't want to say a learning curve, but like there has to be a little bit of like getting comfortable with the correct way. Yeah. Well, especially if it's different than what you've been, if it's diametrically exactly. opposed to I mean. how you've been. Yeah. yeah. There's a quote one of my mentors told me, his name's Tom Purvis. He was like one of the founders of Bowflex and a consultant for Nautilus. He's a brilliant mm -hmm. guy. But he said this great quote to me, and it extends kind of into this, and it's about sports, right? You have to decide, are you going to sacrifice your body for the point? Or are you going to sacrifice the point for the body, right? If Tom Brady goes out in a Super Bowl, and he gets the Super Bowl winning point and snaps his arm in half and can't play football ever again, but he gets the, he wins the Super Bowl, he'll be remembered forever as a hero. Everyone will remember him of how powerful and amazing that moment was. But a lot of us are not Tom Brady in the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. A lot of us are trying to make a name for ourselves and be seen. So we do big things to be seen. And I work so many recreational hockey players that were trying to make it to the NHL and didn't because they threw themselves and did too, too much. Yeah. For Lars Ulrich, Phil Collins, Neil Peart, Dave Silva, and whomever else, all these guys are in the show business. Show business and body business is a bit different. There has to be, in my biased opinion, a schism in between where you do cool looking stuff and you reconcile taking care of your body. But a lot of these guys are doing the big thing to get the point and to be seen. Travis Barker's yeah. flat symbols are not logical for lots of different reasons. But he's not in that business right now. Working fine for him. He probably hasn't hurt himself. People love him. He created a brand. I mean, Orange County Drums literally made a bunch of money just because of the way that he set things up in Blink-182's fame. So it's interesting. Are you willing? So if you're listening to this and you're like, well, this guy, what's he talking about? Are you going to set up your drum set so you can have this body forever? Or is there a chance that you're setting things up to look really cool and neat and they do look badass, I'm sure, but it might sacrifice things in the long run. Yeah. So I think, all right, so that's all kind of, uh, you know, we're talking about setting things up and, and preventative stuff. I personally have had lower back pain for years and it's not all the time, but it's it's like a thing where, I remember picking up like, um, of course, I had a hardware case bag 
kind of thing that 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 had wheels, but I was picking it up and I was like taking it up the stairs and it's always that one little turn. And then I feel like my back kind of went like, sh- like to the side and I like couldn't stand up straight and it was miserable. I went to chiro- uh, to a chiropractor, which helped a lot, but, um, all right. So let's talk about now where some damage has been done. We can, for the sake of conversation, talk about lower back, but there's obviously wrist. There's all, there's neck, there's tons of stuff that can happen. How do you stop the 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 issue that already is happening from getting worse obviously you change things but but it hurts what do you do to make it better yeah so a great question super broad direction that we can go yeah um but i'll t- i'll be the kind of devil's advocate and kind of talk about like the drummer who's between 30 say like 30 plus and maybe has done a little bit of damage to one of their joints because herniated discs uh, you know, I actually have gang- like ganglion cysts where you get the the bumping out in the back of the wrist, um, mm-hmm. carpal tunnel syndrome, like all those things are a kind of a little common. So you're a drummer, you have some pains, you got something, you've been an x-ray, you've seen there's some stuff going on and you're afraid of making it happen again. Well, so one, it kind of comes back to the ergonomics thing and the active range of motion, but it's a bit different. The active range of motion I spoke about earlier was assessing how far your joint can go relative to the position of your drums. Well, if you have an ache, a pain, or a problem, like for me, I have ganglion cysts in the back of my wrist. So that's little cysts in the back of my wrist that how much limit how much wrist extension I have. So if you're looking, I only have about 75 degrees of wrist extension. And this is coming from me doing powerlifting bench pressing when I was 20 years old, thinking it was cool and smashing my wrist and, you know, not knowing much at that point. So yeah, I have limited wrist extension and I can't do push ups on the ground with my wrist at 90 degrees because things hurt. So. What I had to do for a few years was, one, figure out how much motion I have here. My old drum teacher was a jazz guy, and he taught me rudimental drumming, and he always had me do the hit and come up to 90 degrees. And if I couldn't bring, like, do the full stroke and bring the drumstick back to 90 degrees to hold it for an accent stroke, you know, he would criticize me. Well, I realized I actually physically can't go to 90 degrees anymore. Hmm. So that means that I'm going to be limited in how much extension I have and I have to work within that range. So it means that the active range of motion I have is relative to where there is discomfort sensation or what I can do on that one side. Yeah, I mean, and and I, I think, too, that um, for me, and I like, I guess I'm just using myself as a case study, but I really know that everyone else, a lot of other people are probably in this position of having the lower back pain and stuff. And it's that, well, your back wouldn't hurt if you strengthen it. And it's like, oh, okay. And then the next day you're like, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> like yeah. you just because it's it's work and it's time and there's kids and a baby and I feel like strengthening my back would help a lot but then I'm t- what I'm taking from what you're saying though is then know your limit don't push things may change you can still play great but if it's 90% mobility or whatever don't hammer on the last 10% and then make it worse that seems kind of a you know something we can all do is just know our limit yeah, we'll tell you what. Let me. We, we talked about the three levels of biomechanics. I told you the one, which was ergonomics. Let me go over the other two, and then I'll yes. parry back to the back pain because it kind of all stacks up. Sure. Because this is super important, and it's kind of what I do with my practice with my clients every single day. The second level is what I call hormesis management, which is extremely fancy sounding, but hormesis essentially is the relationship between dose and response. So dose response. So if I don't know you from Adam and you're listening to this, I say go to the gym for the first time in your life. Forget that. You play drums for the first time, right? Go sit on a drum set and I say, play a basic rock beat. I guarantee if you play for three seconds, you probably will not get physically tired at any point. You will probably be able to do that and feel fine. If you play the same basic rock beat at call 90 BPM, maybe slower, I don't know, pick your BPM, you'll probably get tired in your right hand at one point from playing those four notes relative to the other foot and the hand that are only playing one, right? Bass drum, you know, the whole one and three and the other hand's playing Eighth notes, playing a lot more notes. Your right hand is probably going to start getting tired. Well, you've never played for that length of time before. So somewhere between the three seconds and the five minutes, you did too much or you started to get to the end of what you're physically able to do. There Mm. is that Goldilocks zone for all things within our body, right? I can eat a certain amount of food. If I eat too much, I get full and I vomit, right? If I don't eat enough, right? I get skinny, right? If I don't get enough sleep, you know, you're a dad. You know how that goes, right? You get too much sleep, other effects. If I don't have enough physics in my body, 
entering my body. Our body is really based off of gravity pushing down into it. If I don't have enough gravity and physics pushing into me, I'll start losing muscle, shrinking, and atrophying, especially over the age of 30. Because in biology, after the age of 30, senescence, we start not regenerating as fast. Yeah. On the other, they continue. If I do too much, right? This is the guys that go to CrossFit and do like a thousand hours of class. Every, they get injured, right? They look shredded, but they're all beat up. So hormesis management is like level two of biomechanical drumming in that you need to identify how, if you want to be really good at drums forever, how many hours a week do you drum or are required to drum if you have a gig, including practice? And are you doing, can you handle that right now without hurting? And if you cannot, where do we figure that out? Do we need to drop back on how much drumming you're doing? Do we need to build up the endurance using strategic resistance exercises, an area that will get you stronger so you can handle the basics of what you do? And truth is, Bart, this is where most drummers end up getting hurt, is that they physically are not, they don't have the endurance to even sustain the basic level of drumming that they do. Gigging drummers are a perfect example. Guys who are on tour who play three-hour shows, and they do five shows, that's 15 hours of intense high-energy drumming playing at 110%, let alone poor sleep, let alone poor eating conditions, let alone practice if they do that, let alone random yeah. jams. I don't know. So the hormesis is that, have you built up enough endurance in your body to even tolerate that level of drumming? Yeah. It seems like it's a part of like, like the more you do something, like you start off just being like, I'm going to play the drums. Great. I'm going to practice a little bit. But then from there, you have the um, I'm going to get really into learning about gear. I'm going to learn in our case here. And if you're listening to the podcast, I'm going to learn about the history of the drums because it, it's all really fun and helps me. It's a part of my practice that that what you're saying with the hormesis sounds like a big part of the practice, too, of just. Like knowing your limits and balancing things and it being, you know, not pushing it too far, but but also setting personal goals to, like, get a little bit better each day. Yeah, it's just it kind of digs deeper at, at what drumming really is, you know? Yeah. And there's, you know, this gets super nerdy and you talked about some psych stuff earlier, but like there's this thing called the Pomodoro method, which is like a learning method. And it's like taking, you know, a few different items of study and studying for 15 or 20 minute increments basically at a time. So that way you never overload and stress one area of your brain out, but you can take like, you know, drumming, you can take paradiddles for 20 minutes, double bass for 20 minutes, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, music theory for 20 minutes. And then you can cycle back because you won't have idea fatigue and you won't have strained that part too much. And it's kind of the, anyway, that's a whole other segment. No, that's that's kind of fun. I, I like that a lot because I, I get, I get like that even with doing the show where you, you do too much of one thing and, and um, it's just, it's, you're just not actually digesting it correctly. And I find that with watching, I love watching like documentaries and stuff, but sometimes I finish it and I go, well, I can't remember a lot of that as opposed to like, reading a little bit at a time you really like fully digest it better and, and leave more knowledgeable like i'll come back to this third level of, of the biomechanical drumming stuff but like motor learning 101 you would be better if you had 60 minutes to practice you'd be better to practice the same thing six times 10 minutes a day with spacing in between than to do a full 60 minutes in a row because you can potentiate it you can stimulate that pattern let it marinate go back to it re-stimulate it Go back, re-stimulate it rather than just dumping it all at once. If you're going to water a garden, you could dump all the water at one time or you could give it a little bit of rain throughout the day. Well, Mother Nature does a great job of sporadically raining it. Well, why don't we do the same thing with our body? Anyway, that's yeah. you know, more nerdy stuff, but I love it. No, and um, it's reminding me, this was a long time ago, but Steven Taylor did a uh, great drummer, um, did an episode way back about, I think it was the history of practice or something. And um God, it's going to drive me nuts. I can't remember, but he was talking about something that wraps like your your neurotransmitters as you basically practice and then you take a break. Um, myelin, myelin, I forget what it myelin was. Chief. It wraps, yes, around your like, you know, I don't know the right even words to use for it, nerve endings or whatever, but it yeah. it's like it, it you get better to, by taking breaks is kind of what I remember from that. Yeah, well, so, you know, it, it, the neatest thing is that there's two different, like when you start learning something new, brand new. It's called, I mean, let me get super nerdy here, but there's short-term potentiation and long-term potentiation. And short-term potentiation is if, like you said that I, you just learned, I'm imagining, I said the word hormesis and you're like, hormesis, mm -hmm. cool. That's the first time you heard that word the first time you say it. You heard it now, you've retained it, it's in your brain, you got it, right? We stop talking, you go home, raise your kids. You're like, what was that word that Brandon said? And if you don't revisit it, you're going to forget it. But if you say it yep. again and a couple more times, it becomes a part of your vernacular and it just becomes sure. soaked in. 
So on the short-term potentiation end, there is like a quick electrical stimulus that goes through when you do something new. That is basically your body experiencing this thing for the first time, right? Your neurons are firing potentially in a new way, especially if you're doing a new rudiment. You're visualizing it. You're hearing it. You're interpreting it. And your body acutely, acutely like the toe stub, is experiencing this thing for the first time. If it doesn't experience it again, you kind of just go to the wayside and it just gets forgotten about because your body dumps redundant information to focus on stuff that's more important. But then you do it again. And now that electrical pathway, kind of like driving down a grassy road that's never been like down a grassy knoll that's never been driven, right? You knock down some of the grass, but the grass starts to pop back up. Then you do it again. You knock down the grass a little bit more and knock it down a little bit more. And then suddenly you're at a place where that grass is no longer there and you've actually created a road. And in your brain, those myelin sheaths and those new neural connections, you actually create anatomical changes where the nerves actually literally wire together. And this is where you and your audience have probably heard of neuroplasticity, where your Mm -hmm. neurons actually like wire together in a new way. And it's why when you see, I don't know, but someone playing something insanely complex, like an orchestration between all four limbs, like how the heck are they playing? Like Thomas Lang, when I watch him play some of those like crazy singles yeah, between all insane. of his limbs or Matt Garska or Virgil Donati, I'm like, that's insane. But their brain has become so well interpreted, has interpreted that information so well that the brain doesn't see it as, you know, four different limbs working together. It sees it as one piece of information that connects it together and they don't even think, you know, right hand, right foot, left hand, left foot. You know, they don't think of that. They just think this thing, this yeah. thing. And that's where thinking rhythmically even, you know, getting to a whole makes a whole difference, right? Sitting yeah. there and going, I'm going to play da, 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 da. Well, if I know that rhythm, it's easy for me to orchestrate that between each foot and each limb. And that's just another whole learning thing. But anyway, I'm yeah. nerdy, man. I love this. No, stuff. it's and, interesting. And, and I, I think that it's kind of, sometimes you get stuck in practicing the same things you're always, you're good at. But then there's like a, for me, I'm sure everyone has a different feeling. It's a distinct feeling of playing something, usually at the left hand, where like, boy, like, I need to work on this and I'm doing it and I'm doing some sort of practice, even playing traditional grip. I'm like, this is not that comfortable for me right now, but each time it gets a little bit easier. And, and that, that, that feeling is sort of, I feel like it's a good thing to be pushing yourself and being a little uncomfortable. Um, but it's, it's definitely easier just to fall back on your normal stuff, but to get to like the Virgil Donati's and Thomas Lang's, I mean, you just got to practice and, and practice the right thing. I mean, those guys have been going, you know, B to the walls for as long as they possibly can. And their normal, comfortable level is insane because they've gone to that next level and they just found a comfortable medium. Yeah. So that kind of leads to my third level of biomechanics. So we got ergonomics, NASA star control around your body. Then can you hormesis management? Have you made sure or are you taking the steps required from a fitness end, health end to make sure you even have the requirements, the substrates to play the length of time you want to play each week. And then the third level is the optional level, which is where I call it performance enhancement. And truth is, I love this level, not because I'm biased for it, because I think it's where the real magic happens. I'll share this, and this will sound a little grimmer than it's intended to be, but I mentioned earlier at the age of 30, our body stops regenerating to its third point. And every decade, we regenerate slower and age as we all know. And we all just call aging, right? You're 70 years old and you move slower and you got white hair. You go, oh, I'm just older. And you kind of, most people, at least our parents' age, re- concede to the idea of retirement and being older, right? I'm old now. I do less things. Well, the only difference between an old person and a new younger person, a new person, <laughs> a young person <laughs> is, a I guess that's true, person. fresh human, <laughs> yeah. is the regenerative <laughs> abilities. And what our body does is we get older is it starts to quickly get rid of expensive organs and things in our systems. Our muscles, very expensive. If, our, if we are super focused on drumming and we play career-wise, right? Our hands are working real hard. Our feet are working hard, right? But we, we don't really use our hamstring muscles very often or our ab muscles very much in the same way as these other muscles. As we get older, if we don't stimulate those things, our body will actually slowly atrophy the abdominals a little bit, make them a little smaller, atrophy the hamstrings a little bit, atrophy the lower back muscles. And at a certain point, when we get closer to 60 and 70, it's insidious and it's happening no matter what. So we got to do everything we can, we can to hold on to this roller coaster. In most cases, people like you and I, like I've hurt my back too. The areas that we hurt our back 
either for whatever reason lost strength and or couldn't keep up with the demand of what we've been doing with the stacking of events. You talked about picking something up. You probably played a gig. Then you probably hung up with some friends and you did some skateboard stuff. Then you did this and you did that. And it all felt fine until it was that one second. that The straw was what broke the camel's back. Yes. The stronger and the better we can get today, the better you will be at playing your instrument. Now you won't get tired and you will also make sure that you'll be able to play this thing decades going forward. When you see these miracle videos of 100-year-old sprinters and 95-year-old women still going to gymnastics, the reason is they're not insanely magical. They're just hard workers. And they've just built up such an exceptional fortitude that when the drop-off of aging happens, their drop-off is not that significant compared to their peers. Sure. I feel like there's a mental thing a lot of people where they they hit a certain age and they um, just, it's like you said, it's it's what... It's what you do. You just kind of slow down and you stop doing stuff. And um, and also, I had a buddy where I think uh, I am not a golfer at all, but we were at a driving range years ago, uh, like over a decade ago, and hitting the ball. And I think I was just obviously just knocking the hell out of it as hard as I could. And um, a friend who did golf was telling me that, you know, you'll see 70, 80-year-old guys just hit 200 yards, whatever, whatever's a normal golf distance. And, and they're not really hitting it. They're not swinging that hard. It's just like the economy of motion and the, the correct hitting. And, um, and I know that I think Dom Fimularo came, talked about that with, uh, when he learned about the same, the molar technique about how these, these old civil war, you know, vets would be learning and Sanford molar would look at them and go, these guys are so old, but they're hitting. So they're getting so much power. Uh, and I probably use that same reference in that episode about the golf thing, but they, um, they're just doing it correctly and, and not letting it, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's doing things the right way for a long time. 100%. That's exactly it. And it's, you know, my grandmother and my grandfather, my grandpa's 88, my grandmother that he's met my step grandmother technically, but she is 77. They crush me at golf consistently and I try to muscle it and man, I can hit it far when I hit it but yeah. I don't hit it a lot and they go out there and they're just whistling and straight straight. And it's because the 77, you know, it's like going out with your 77 year old grandmother and she kicks your ass at go. It's brutal, but it comes yeah. back to economizing the motion to make it so autonomous and so smooth that you don't have to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. So ergonomics, hormesis and performance enhancement. Um, it's, it's pretty like, I don't know. It's like an actionable list that people can kind of just even if you I'm a, you know, big believer. And if like even if you just start thinking about it now and, uh, you know, if in like over that over a period of time, start applying these uh, these types of um, ways to improve yourself is a good start. Take it one day at a time. You know, are you comfortable behind your drum set? No. Okay. well, let's try and figure out to make it feel comfortable because if it's not comfortable, It'll be even less comfortable one day. Then you're there. Cool. How do we start getting you a little stronger? Just a little to make sure that everything that you like to do on the drums is no problem. Is that home exercise? Is that going to the gym? Is it actually even doing exercise at your drum throne? Because you could totally do a full little fitness routine just sitting on your throne. Hmm. That'd be great. It's a good idea. Third idea after this is once you feel good about all that stuff, take this beyond drumming, but take it into your own hands to make yourself as healthy as possible. Because I guarantee you, if you hear me say this and you actually do this decades from now, you'll thank me because you'll pay dividends and you'll look over one day when you're 60 or 70 at people beside you that are the same age and you'll see you haven't aged that much and they've aged a lot more. And it was all because you took steps now and you're still playing music, playing art, which is really what this is all about. Yeah. Yeah. You'll look at them and you'll go, thank you, Brandon. <laughs> when Who was that old, weird dude on that podcast <laughs> drum history years ago? Yeah. I love that guy. No, that's, that's awesome. And, um, I mean, I, I just, uh, I I'm guilty of it too. And it's, it's of, of just not putting things into motion. And one thing I will say that everyone knows this, but it's just such like, like having the like pain from, from drumming or doing anything like, like shoulder pain, which I've, I've had a little here and there for years. It's not going like, it's not when you're stretching and reaching and moving. It's like the opening the dishwasher, small movements. It's the changing the button, the, 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 you know, hitting the button on the radio that like sort of like smaller motion for me or like bending over a little bit to do something as opposed to just a quick bend down and up. 
that can be brutal. That can be, that's what I need to dial in is like, why are these little small motions causing pain as opposed to, you know, I can go running and it's great, but it's like, sometimes you just like it's the, the one little movement will just kill you. Yeah. How do you make it that when you don't have to think about how you move, right? Like that's, yeah. that's the real key. Cause if you have to think about the movement you do, like I have a small tear in my left medial meniscus, my inside knee, and it's good 95% of the time. And then when it's not, it's like, son of a gun. And I got to think about how I'm moving, right? Yeah. How do we get past that? In some cases you can't, yeah. but you can do some cool stuff. So I hope yeah. this is helpful. Extremely helpful. I feel like because this is the drum history podcast, we should talk a little bit about, I mean, this might be a whole thing to discuss in itself, but I mean, what is the kind of history of studying this uh, for drummers? Is this something that's like, pretty widely done. I would assume you're not the only guy in the world who's doing this kind of information. Uh, but like, uh, how far back does this go? I feel like this isn't something where people in the seventies and eighties were really worried about their ergonomics and things like that. No, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't think anybody was really talking about this at a deep level before I did that YouTube video. And I'm, if someone has some other stuff, please share it with me. So I don't sound so hubristic to say I'm the starter. But, uh, you know, Dave Elich is talking more about the body nowadays, which is great, right? Sure. He doesn't have like insane biomechanical background, but he's got a great audience and he's got a great heart around it. And I think that that's huge because he's got such great reach. If he can help people a little get started into it, that's huge. Uh, I know there's a in University of Windsor, there's someone named Dr. Nadia Azar who's been doing some stuff with Drumeo and she's been doing some stuff on heart rate stuff with them. She's in the biomechanics lab, but she, I think her thing's called the Drummer Lab. She's doing some stuff with heart rate. Uh, I know I've seen more people talking about fitness for drummers in the last little while, and I think it's great. I don't have a business here. I honestly just love this, and I think that it's just so great that people are talking about how to take care of this thing so we can all make art together. I mean, that, like I said at the beginning, seeing guys like Phil Collins and Neil Peart and others stop doing things because they said their back hurt is just heartbreaking to me. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. And I don't want anyone to have to go through that experience. No. And back pain is literally, I mean, it's someone, someone out there can always have something worse than what you have going on, but back pain is miserable. Like there is, it is, it is terrible when you have to experience it. But, um, anyway, on a, a lighter note, you yourself, my friend are a monster drummer, like watching your, looking at your YouTube page and all that, which I'll put links in the description. Um, you are are great, and I love how you you're very. I mean, you're you're doing awesome production. Your your setup looks great. Everything is good. But I, I want to also ask you. You wrote for Modern Drummer. You've written in for Modern Drummer and things like that. Um, what's that experience like? I mean, that has to be cool to get to write for MD. I mean, that's huge. You know, it was a super cool story. And you know, Mike Dawson, one of your previous guests. Thank yep. you so much, Mike. Honestly, for giving me that opportunity. I am eternally blessed for that. So I, I told you about my buddy Matt Dunn that I made the video for on YouTube, got a bunch of views. Um, I honestly was just trying to figure out how to help more drummers. And I reached out to a bunch of people on Instagram, like Mike Dawson, Mike Johnston, several other people that I won't name because I didn't hear back from a lot of people. <laughs> I mean, I was some guy that was just posting gratuitous drumming of me crushing it, I guess, but not really anything mechanical on Instagram. Um, yeah. But I was just asking, hey, listen, can I ask you a couple quick questions? And I'm sure they get thousands of emails and messages like that. And I told Dawson, I said, hey, listen, because he responded to me. Nice guy. I said, listen, I'm working yeah. on some stuff to try and help drummers be healthier. I'm just trying to figure out the best medium to try and help get in in front of more people. I'll happily compensate you for your time if you want to jump on a call and let's talk. So we talked and I was just interviewing him. I mean, I was asking him a million questions and he goes, well, you could just do it for us. And I was like, all right, man, cool. Because I mean, like you probably, I was a, yeah. yeah, I was a modern drummer kid though. Like I was like, you know, since I started playing drums 21 years ago, I had like modern drummer magazines and I was trying to oh, play yeah. like the Afro Cuban lick in the back that I never use, yep. you know, all those things because they had all like, the different genres, right? Like the jazz totally. page and the rock page. Yeah. Um, so that was an incredible honor. But to be honest, it, it sprung board so much more for me because he they wanted video accompaniment along with the writing. So I had to work on writing. Uh, I had to get an editor to make sure my writing was not terrible because I wanted to make sure that like my, my first and I was, I had to learn a lot about writing. Um, and then I actually had to learn about production a little bit. Like how do I set like up here? How do I set up drums and have an audio mic that yep. doesn't sound like hot garbage? And yeah. um, that was huge for me. I learned how to talk on camera. That was uh, six years ago now that I started doing that. And it was just, it was really, really great. 
uh, because it brought me um, for a while. I was heavily associated with Buddy at Love Custom Drums because of that, which is super awesome. Love Buddy. He's awesome. Got me out to Nam a few times. I got to meet a bunch of my heroes. And it was all because of, truthfully, Mike Dawson giving me that platform to share out. Um, That's awesome. So it was, it was truly an honor. I love it. And uh, I'm sad Di- yeah. uh, Dawson's no longer at MD, but you know he's crushing it elsewhere. So that's really cool. He is. And Drum Factory Direct is great. And I will say that you have an interview with Mike Dawson on the Drum Candy podcast, which um, I was telling Brandon before we started, like I listened to, I started listening to it because I, I love Mike's show, but I was like, wait a minute, I don't want to listen. It was like yesterday. And I was like, I don't want to listen to this the day before I'm doing the interview because it's like, you, you don't want it to like affect how you handle an interview. But anyway, what I heard was great. And Mike's show is just incredible in general. But that just goes to show that like um, one thing can can really springboard a whole bunch of other stuff. And you 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 just I'm sure you were, you know, at first kind of like a little nervous to do it. But like like you said, you found the help that was needed. And then it look what it did for you. I mean, you you're doing a, gr- a great thing for drummers and YouTube is huge and all this stuff. And uh, I think it's really cool that you kind of seize the opportunity. I mean, you, you took full advantage of it. Thank you, man. I'm grateful for it. And honestly, there's some opportunities behind the scenes of some things that I'm involved with that I'm super stoked about that I can't talk about right now. Cool. Uh, but it's great. I mean, it's all be it's truthfully all because of Mike Dawson. And so I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. Mike's a good guy. Shout out to Mike. Um, so again, I'll put dis- the link in the description for all that stuff. Awesome, Brandon. This has been great, man. Um, so everyone listening, Brandon is going to be kind enough to hang out and we're going to do a Patreon bonus episode, which it's been a little while since I've done one. So uh, just because sometimes when you do a two hour episode, they uh, on John Bonham or something at the end, people are like, I just want to be done. <laughs> so um, yes, Brandon, we're going to be talking about your I have it written down here, your mid 1920s Otto Geisler edition uh, Slingerland snare drum, which has a cool story. And you got a lot of information from Brooks Tegler, who's a great friend of the show. Um, so I'm excited to hear about that. Uh, it's going to be a video episode. So if you guys want to watch it, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast or on uh, my website, drumhistorypodcast.com. There's a link there and all that good stuff. Um, so Brandon, as we finish up here, man, do you want to just give people your you know social media you know handles and all that stuff where they can find you? Yeah, everyone. So on Instagram, as it relates to this content, search I'm at drum mechanics. I post a lot of stuff to me drumming and practicing because I just love playing, but there are health things up there. And if you have any questions, please send me a message. I'd love to try and personally help as many people as I possibly can. I got nothing to sell you. This is not like a fitness drum thing. So at drum mechanics on Instagram, if you search Brandon Green drums, you'll find my YouTube page, which I haven't posted anything in a little while, but there's a ton of stuff up there on drum throne height. All my videos from modern drummer are up there now because well, things have changed. So it's all up there now. So there's a lot of really, really great stuff. So Brandon Green drums, it's actually Brandon Green on YouTube, Drum Mechanics okay. on Instagram. And you can follow my other businesses if you want, but I'll let you find them. Yeah, you can send me the links and I'll put them all in the description. And um, I think you told me a while ago, but where are you located? I am in Newmarket, Canada, north of Toronto. Okay, hey. so if anyone who's listening is, you know, somewhat close to there, obviously they can reach out and, uh, and you know, get trained and you know shred their muscles and get swole and all that good stuff and uh <laughs> get as jacked. they say but get Listen, jacked. If, if there are many drummers if there's enough of you that are close to me and you guys hear me say this and you want me to do like a little ergonomics workshop in person if i get a handful of you let me know and we'll figure something out because i think that would be a blast i have a lot of drums so we can actually play around and have some fun that'd be awesome great idea keep us updated if that happens um so um, I think that's it for today, man. I, so Brandon, thank you for joining me here. Thanks everyone for listening. And, uh, Brandon and I are going to hop over and do the Patreon bonus episode. Um, so Brandon, thank you for being here. Bart, this has been an honor. It's so much fun. And I'm excited to talk about the snare drum. <laughs>